Talk Business Arkansas is brought to you by the Arkansas Farm Bureau, the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce and Associated Industries of Arkansas, the Electric Cooperatives of Arkansas, Noble Strategies, the Arkansas Healthcare Association, and Delta Trust and Bank. I'm Roby Brock with your Talk Business Arkansas update. Voter ID was front and center at the Capitol today, but first, let's start with your business headlines. Delta Timber Corporation has entered into an agreement to purchase the 50% membership interest in Dell 10 Fiber, currently owned by a subsidiary of international paper companies Temple Inland. The transaction's valued at $20 million. Upon completion of the transaction, Delta will hold 100% of the membership interest in the Arkansas Limited Liability Company which owns and operates a medium density fiber board plant in El Dorado. A lack of available school administrators means public schools should consider looking outside public education to fill some leadership position. That's the state's education commissioner's position. Dr. Tom Kimbrell tells Talk Business that school districts should consider hiring proven outside leaders, such as entrepreneurs, engineers, plant managers, as principals and superintendents. It's a debate we're likely to see more of in the future, but no legislation is presently planned on the subject. Well, what's in store for the retail sector going forward? Disruption, according to one expert. Carol Speakerman says suppliers to Walmart stores better figure out how they fit into a new transmedia world that she thinks will dominate the way large retailers operate in the years to come. Transmedia describes how the intersection of technology and social media has and will continue to change the way retailers connect to and interact with consumers. Speakerman is the president and CEO of Bentonville-based New Market Builders. You can read her full comments on our website at talkbusinessarkansas.com. Well, after the break, voter ID was the hot topic of the day at the state capitol. We're going to talk about some of the details of what went down in the state agencies committee in the Senate this morning. And later, Representative Warwick Sabin sits down to talk about a new ethics proposal that he's helping push as well as a public-private proposal. I'm Roby Brock. This is Talk Business. Well, I don't think it's going to be an easy conversation uh, because they are very strong-willed. I think it's going to be important to us that we know that you're somewhere in a facility uh, that looks after you, has compassion, has care, and you respect it. I mean, I'd love to look after them. I'd love to be able to take care of them, but I don't think I could. That'd be a wrong choice on my part. Arkansas's skilled nursing and assisted living centers provide quality care for our seniors. Farm Bureau helps protect its members in more ways than you might think. They've always been the voice of agriculture in Arkansas, working on behalf of folks like me when nobody else would. And Farm Bureau stands for the values that Arkansas families care about. They've protected my right to farm and make a living, which helps everybody who likes food on the table. You know what they say, Arkansas counts on agriculture and agriculture counts on Farm Bureau. The Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce and Associated Industries of Arkansas. The State Chamber AIA is the leading voice for business at the state capitol and serves as the primary business advocate on all issues affecting Arkansas employers. Our mission is to promote a pro-business, free enterprise agenda and prevent anti-business legislation, regulations, and rules. Now more than ever, business matters. Learn more at ArkansasStateChamber.com. Yesterday, we sat down with State Senator Brian King to talk about his proposal to push for voter identification at the polls in Arkansas. You can still view part of that uh, interview that we did on our website at TalkBusinessArkansas.com. Today in the Senate State Agencies Committee, his bill was heard. Here's what action took place. King's proposal was grilled by Senator Robert Thompson and David Johnson over cost of the proposal and the need to address a problem that they viewed as not widespread. Brian King's Senate Bill 2 would allow for photo IDs at polling places on Election Day, but would allow for other utility bills, bank statements, or government documents if voting by mail. There are exceptions for those living in nursing homes or assisted living facilities. Those without ID could vote a provisional ballot under the bill's guidelines, and the Secretary of State is required to establish a voter identification card system for those without a driver's license. 
King is also planning to incorporate the legislation into a constitutional amendment. The bill was passed out of committee on a voice vote today. We turn to ethics now. After the break, I'll sit down with Representative Warwick Sabin. He is pushing an ethics proposal that goes farther than a citizen's initiative would. Details after the break. Noble Strategies is a bipartisan state and federal government affairs firm with a successful track record of providing effective advocacy for business, government, and nonprofit entities. Noble Strategies provides service in areas such as lobbying, public affairs, trade association management, and marketing campaigns. Learn more at noblestrat.com. I was looking for a bank that could best protect my finances. They shared my passion for my business's potential. A bank that offered investment expertise. Linden support. Insurance guidance. A bank that delivered full financial support. That's how I found True Balance. True Balance. From my bank. From my bank. Delta Trust and Bank, the expertise to meet all your financial needs. One of the real advantages of Electric Cooperatives membership is having a voice in our state's energy future. Not a week goes by without important energy issues making headlines. These are issues that need to be discussed. And you should know that as policies are being developed, the cooperatives are looking out for our members, advocating what's best for you. We are your friends and neighbors. We are your local electric company. The Electric Cooperatives. We are, we are, Arkansas. Joining me now is Representative Warwick Saban. He is a Democrat from Little Rock. He also is not only a freshman legislator, but he is the chairman of the freshman caucus there. <laughs> right. So thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Ropey. Let's start first with ethics, and then I want to talk about another bill that you uh, have in the works, too. But uh, you guys, you and Senator John Woods, are pushing uh, ethics reform uh, proposed constitutional amendment that would do three of the things that Regnet Populous, uh, the Citizens Initiative Group, wants to do. Tell me about those three, three things first and then we'll talk about what you're doing in addition to that. Sure, and the three things that you're talking about come straight from the Regna Populist proposal that was certified by the Attorney General, but the first element is a total gift ban for legislators, so it's the Walmart rule. We wouldn't even be able to accept a cup of coffee. Um, the second provision is to extend the cooling off period from, becoming a, uh, from being a legislator to becoming a lobbyist from one year to two years. And then the third element would be a total ban on corporate contributions to political campaigns. How controversial is banning corporate contributions to political, to political campaigns? As a candidate, you know how hard it is to raise money, and you see a lot of your colleagues around here. That's the number one complaint I have heard from some legislators, is it's tough to raise money for these races. That's absolutely true. And, uh, you know, it's, it's controversial for a lot of reasons. I mean, I think from, you know, just the practical element of running a campaign to, you know, certain uh, constitutional questions to even the idea that, you know, by banning corporate contributions, all you're doing is ensuring that, you know, PAC contributions happen. And, and PAC contributions aren't necessarily any more transparent and maybe even less transparent than corporate contributions. Mm -hmm. And all of those are fair arguments. Um, but, you know, the Regnet Populous ballot initiative is going to be on the ballot in 2014 unless we act on it during this legislative session. And so the pitch that I've been making to my colleagues is this is our opportunity to fix what you might think, you know, is not necessarily wrong with Regna Populus, but, you know, certainly it lets you clarify, improve, um, and change, you know, those measures. And, and the key to this whole amendment that John and I introduced yesterday is that I brought Regnet Populus to the table uh, through its chairman, Paul Spencer, and, and the group that was with us yesterday they are willing to compromise on the measures that they've put forward. So, you know, whether it's the gift ban or whether, you know, it's this corporate contribution thing, we're going to have everybody at the table, whether that's legislators, whether those are other interest groups, and certainly regnant populace, everybody's going to be working together to craft the best possible amendment that we can pass through both houses. So there is the possibility that what regnant populace has proposed may be altered some. May be tweaked. And Paul Spencer said that publicly yesterday when we had a little press availability yesterday uh, in, the, in the rotunda. He said, you know, we are approaching this in good faith, just as we are on the other side, to try to come up with the best possible measure that, you know, has broad bipartisan, bicameral support. And so, you know, it may be that we can't reach that compromise, but they're certainly willing to tweak, 
their measure, and I think that was the starting point to be able to introduce the amendment. So there's two other things that you have uh, that you guys want to roll into this amendment to. One is a citizens commission to kind of set legislative pay, take that out of legislators' hands, and the second thing is extending term limits. Yeah. And and just again to give you the background on this, you know, I, I started the session, you know, really shopping around the regnant populist proposals, and in fact, I have three bills drafted that represent the three regnant populist provisions. I've had them drafted for a few weeks. I haven't filed them because I'm having these conversations with my colleagues, again, on, on both sides of the aisle. And the sense I got was that there would be more impetus to deal with these issues if we could sort of craft a comprehensive ethics and good government package. And in a lot of ways, you know, uh, legislative salary, I mean, is, is not very modern uh, compared to other right. states. And then, you know, especially I would say in the government affairs community and among legislators, there's a sense that term limits are too short, that you get in and by the time you're really figuring things out, you're gone. And that really hurts everybody. I mean, it, it, and not that term limits are a bad thing, but maybe they were just too draconian when they were put into place. And so it seemed to me after all these conversations that we could maybe get regnant populist passed if we could also build in these other elements. And that's what happened. And, and the Citizens Commission on, on Legislative Pay, that's actually all Senator Wood's idea. I mean, he was going to file that separately, and I think he has filed it separately, to model a, a Citizens Commission after what exists in eight other states around the country where legislators are completely uninvolved in setting their own salaries, that an independent commission would do that for us. And that way, there's no conflict of interest. Um, and again, the term limits thing, I mean, that's controversial and it might even hurt the chances of passing a constitutional amendment at the ballot. But I think if everybody understands from the beginning that we're trying to, again, craft a compromise that everybody can live with, mm -hmm. and if it goes to the ballot in that spirit, then maybe people will understand what we're trying to do. Have you heard from the term limits pro uh, proponents, the supporters of term limits on this? You mean extending term limits? Uh, people that, uh, oh, I guess, sorry. helped pass the original term limits that have come back and fought every potential change to term limits that's come up in previous years. I quite honestly have not heard from them yet. Um, be happy to talk to them. You know, we obviously, you know, want to, you know, please as many people as we can knowing that that's going to be impossible. But, um, you know, it, it, there's so many different elements that kind of enter into this conversation. Because once you start talking about ethics and you talk about, you know, the way our system is set up and the fact that, you know, I mean, Arkansas has a lot of antiquated ways that our legislature acts. I mean, especially when compared to other states. I mean, the fact that we, you know, meet biennially, the fact that there's really no staff for legislators, the fact that, again, the salaries are so low that, you know, unless you're wealthy or willing to work two jobs at once, which is what I do, then, you know, it's really a difficult place to serve, and it's also difficult to attract talent. So, clearly, I mean, we're not trying to get rid of term limits, you know, just trying to extend them. And, again, if that falls out of this proposal, you know, we may have to go another route, yep. but that's how we're approaching this right now. Let's talk about another uh, bill, piece of legislation that you've got in mind. It's a, it's a public-private partnership bill, a P3 is kind of the concept that's described. Tell me how it works. Sure. Well, um, this P3 legislation has actually been adopted in over 30 states around the country, and the main thing that it does is it clarifies the way that public entities can interact with private entities for public infrastructure projects. And that can be, you know, projects at higher ed institutions, it can be highway projects, uh, it can be, you know, utility projects. But basically, uh, you know, it kind of clarifies the rules. It, it makes clear that we're not, you know, messing with existing statutes when it comes to eminent domain, when it comes to the Freedom of Information Act, uh, you know, when it comes to all kinds of different procurement laws. But it, it helps... Uh, you know, install best practices. It creates a legislative tax, a task force to oversee that. Uh, and, you know, one of the main things it does, too, is it, it, maybe the most revolutionary part of it, is it simply allows private entities to put forth unsolicited bids, uh, you know, for or unsolicited proposals for projects that they might think would be in the public interest. But, uh, again, it's worked very well in all of the states where it's been instituted. It helps divert some of the uh, finance burden and risk burden from the public entity to the private entity, uh, which obviously benefits the public entity. And in this day and age, when it's so difficult for us to address so many of these infrastructure issues, it creates a tool 
for all of these different entities to take advantage of. Does it also create, um, though, some dangers in that you could get into some of the things like we've seen, I think it was up in the maybe Michigan or somewhere, there was a bridge that was privately financed <laughs> and the, you know, the gentleman uh, wound up, I think, going bankrupt over right. it. I mean, could you get into some situations like that? How do you guard against that? Well, I mean, you know, nothing under our current system nor under, you know, this proposal that I have, I mean, perfectly guards against every possible negative thing that could possibly happen. But one thing that my legislation does do, and it's 17 pages long, and like I said, you know, it, it makes clear up front that we're not uh, torpedoing any existing statutes in this realm, but it does actually put in more uh, safeguards, uh, expert review, uh, peer review. I mean, basically, it, it helps address the exact thing that you're talking about, where if a public entity is going to enter into one of these partnerships, it's going to make sure that it's been thoroughly vetted and that you know the risk potential for the public entity is minimized to the greatest degree possible. Any resistance to the bill yet? No, I mean, it really, the only, <laughs> I wouldn't call it resistance, but you know, when you file a 17-page bill, people want to take some time to look at it, and we certainly have allowed that to happen. But you know, we've gotten enthusiastic support from the Highway Commission, I mean, sorry, the Highway Department, and they, they testified in favor of it. Uh, the utilities testified in favor of it, and uh, the higher ed community loves it. And uh, you know, so far, you know, I, I think once people understand it, once they study it, once they see how it's worked in other places, they understand how it can be a good thing for Arkansas. All right. He's Representative Warwick Sabin. Thank you so much for being with Thanks, us. Thanks, Roby. I really appreciate, appreciate it. it. We'll have you, you back when some of these things progress a little bit more. I'm Roby Brock. You can keep up with the latest business and political headlines at talkbusinessarkansas.com. We'll see you next week. Talk Business Arkansas is brought to you by the Arkansas Farm Bureau, the Arkansas State Chamber of Commerce and Associated Industries of Arkansas, the Electric Cooperatives of Arkansas, Noble Strategies, the Arkansas Healthcare Association, and Delta Trust and Bank.